the Thoughty or Tea podcast. In your experience, either with yourself through the research or from sort of personal accounts from other people, how can THC and CBD be beneficial to like specifically autistic people? Like I know oh. you talked about the triad of suffering and like <laughs> stuff, but is there anything else that you'd like to kind of... I'm so glad because I started bringing it up when I was talking about the survey for the pain, anxiety, sleep thing. And I like yeah. never got to the point with that, with that story, which is, you know, that's just how I guess that's how it is. Some other tangent that was shiny caught my attention and I went <laughs> down that hole. But yes, there are specific therapeutic benefits for autistic, ADHD, neurodivergent, PTSD, TBI people. They're like for people with like different types of atypicalities, definitely. But you know, specifically going down the lane of the autistic ADHD, more like hypersensitive route, hypersensitive, hyperactive brain, modal, like neurotype type people, there are some unique benefits. Like one of them is the mood regulation benefit, which has been documented before. Mood that I've can, never heard of the mood the, regulation. Like I assume that because of the euphoria and stuff, it would be like a Right, like a so uplifter. Up, upscale. No, the uh, the mood regulation effect is one of the long term effects. It's one of the it's one of the effects that is, and this is also full disclosure. Like this survey was is is just the first preliminary one. We are going to have to do way more research. Actually, my nonprofit is planning and is currently doing the very first piece of that research right now. Unfortunately, people in the UK can't take it. So I'm sorry. In the future, when we go global, though, I'm going to send it to you so that you can share with everyone if they want to partake. Because it's really important that we start to document these unique therapeutic benefits. So mood regulation is one of them. Another one is focus and productivity. So it's interesting. Most people think cannabis makes people lazy, but a, a significant number of people will utilize cannabis to actually help them to focus and to get more things done. And then the last one is so close and so near and dear to my heart is overstimulation because sensory overstimulation is something that when I got diagnosed, when I understood that component of my brain, it changed my ability to regulate myself. When I understood that, you know, I, I'm not super light sensitive out of all things my wife is, but I'm super sound That's sensitive. I'm, I'm very, very sound sensitive. I'm very, very touch tactile, like tactile types of sensitivity. I'm pretty much hypersensitive to everything. <laughs> to everything. Apart from, okay. apart from heavy pressure and okay. vestibular and proprioceptive stuff. So I have horrible being proprioception. Sensitive, <laughs> I have like the most terrible proprioception out of everyone. I feel like I'm kind of small, but somehow I'm running into everything, like just all the time. And I still so, don't know what the difference between vestibular hyposensitivity and dyspraxia is. I'm, I'm still I, uh, trying to find somebody who is dyspraxic but not autistic. I can't. I can't seem to find anybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> interesting there's all these overlaps right like this is so these these accounts like this was what was really like so powerful to me is that i opened this survey for literally just 24 hours it was just a quick like let's take a snapshot of those of us who are willing to contribute to this information and i got over 2000 respondents in 24 hours and over 600 people out of those 2000 people wrote me a little message I, I said, if is there anything that you want to share, like about your use? And I'm also posting this publicly, so it'll be it's anonymous. Like you can't see who posted what. Yeah. yeah. But that it, you know, it, you're if if you want to share your story, this is the moment because it's it, it literally is still on my website. If anyone wants to go look at it and read what other people had to say themselves from their own experience, it's up there. And there's 600 different little accounts, different things that people wanted to share. Some of them quite detailed about experimentation that neurodivergent people have used. Um, and in the survey, it was mostly autistic ADHD people. There was like a smattering of a lot of other things and a small percentage of people who didn't identify as neurodivergent. But you know, it, this is really powerful because it's something that in terms of like you asked me earlier what my mission was and and the mission of my life really changed when I started being open about using cannabis for my mental health and about being neurodivergent and I, when I became out professionally about both of those things. It My life changed drastically because people started 
really sharing their personal stories with me, I, you know, and I, I, out of curiosity as a scientist too, like I love the personal stories. I mean, human human data is always going to be the most important data for a pharmaceutical scientist. Like I, I study drugs in the brain. I, I don't think that it's as important to look at what it does in mice as what it does in humans. That's just my opinion. I, I value the human in brain. In vivo, in vitro experimentation and i I have (laughs) weird feelings about mouse research because i did it so i'm gonna like be i'm gonna take a step i knew some some people in thailand who did um cardiovascular research i'm so not um, a fan of i i said i I said no thanks for for the first few weeks (laughs) no thanks for me (laughs) i was like i I don't they're they're really cute I think that they're so oh, cute. No, mice, mice, and rats, and they're like I little, know, cin- you know, little Cinderella, like Gus Gus, and like you know, mm. like I, I'm just like not a fan. I mean, especially when it comes to neuroscience. So, also like probably clear, but my special interest is the neurodivergent brain on drugs. Like it's been my special interest for you know since I was 15. Before that, my special interests were like way less interesting to other people. So. Like that part is actually nice that it happens to be something that I think can help other people. But, you know, I'm very. Like, well, because when you were saying about like, particularly for the sort of hyperactive kind of neurodivergent types. What about like individuals like myself who don't, who are, who are just autistic and. I mean, there's obviously like loads of crossovers and it's, it's, it's based on like psychological traits and criteria that people can look for. But, um, for the most of it, I'm autistic, not ADHD. Like, well, I don't know that I consider them different, but that's also a different, no, that's, 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 a whole, like, that's a whole, that's a whole rabbit hole of like, I, I don't necessarily believe they're different. I think that they might be different expressions, right. Or different, like, because from from me to you and like how I perceive your brain, like I don't perceive that you have like any less going on up here than me. It just has to do with like the expression, right? Yeah. Like, and so in, in terms of for that, like it is very, very similar in therapeutic benefit. It just like maybe looks different. And, and if anything, like you are probably more stoic. And I, I have a lot of neurodivergent friends. I mean, I only... I am pretty much only able to pay attention to neurodivergent people. I feel like I I don't t- I don't really find neurotypical people interesting enough to like keep to keep my cuz I like the brain I like brains. I like interesting brains. I like learning about people and I don't know I, I do I do have a particular fascination with neurotypicals. That's kind of that's the angle at which I started my like understanding cuz I just found them like very interesting. I'm not kind sure of like if a they reverse ex- autism I, researcher. Do you think that they <laughs> exist for real? I'm not convinced that they exist and that they're not just like neurodivergent <laughs> people who are like really, really good at masking and like really, really like expending a ton of energy on that or something. I don't know. I maybe, maybe I, I can't. I can't tell. I'm sure that they exist. I've had a couple of friends be like, "Well, I'm neurotypical," and I'm kind of like, "I don't think so." But <laughs> yeah. you're welcome to think that way. And I, I, I just won't say anything because, you know, sometimes that's like pretty insulting to sometimes people like I don't think disability is a bad word anymore. You know, like I, I think that it comes with challenges, certainly, and that every every person is different. Different disabilities have different levels of challenges and like different types of disabilities also. Right. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that for everyone, disability is not a bad thing because it can be. It can be extremely challenging, and it depends on your life circumstances and your yeah. your ability to I provide mean, for yourself. My my particular sort of thoughts about like like I've never viewed it as like necessarily like a bad thing. Like uh, as far as like viewing it through like the social model of disability, it's very that's very like applicable for me. But I think a word which is like characterized by an inability to do something feels quite like like just the the premise of it is negative not not meaning that it's like you're the a bad roots person of the you, words of the roots of the word is what you're saying because it's disability mm. i feel that yeah. actually that's a really great point i've never really thought about it that way but and that's the only like, that's the only thing and it's like i don't mind calling myself like disabled it's just that 
I, you know? I don't like I don't either. I don't think it's a bad thing. But the reason why I think has to do with advocacy, because I think that like viewing disability that way and understanding disability is more powerful to be able to fight for like advocacy for rights and like. 100%. I, I, so like it's rooted in that, which is not it's like I, I've had conversations about this before, too, because the same thing with cannabis use, like what you're saying about like that the adult use, the recreational use market, like for me, like anyone who uses cannabis regularly, regardless of whether you have a medical card or not, it's likely medical, right? And there are problems with us, like over medicalizing our terminology. And at the same time, the reason why I do it is for advocacy, because it is the most powerful route to getting access. It's the most powerful route for changing your legal, the legal perspective of, of the people who you know, if if anyone here who's listening to like if the, if you know your local legislation, like if you are involved with anyone within your local town or your local city who may be interested in learning more about the therapeutic benefits, about how that we could bring about community level change and how community level population level change with cannabis and with CBD like is happening and does happen and can work, you know, there's information available, but you could just send them this, right? Like, or you could send them anything. It doesn't have to be this, you know, but you could, you could send no, no, them. No, 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 go with that. <laughs> yes. Send them this podcast. <laughs> send them this podcast. <laughs> share well, it's, them out. Sure. It's, it's like interesting. And subscribe and. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting because I think that it's perspectives that like these are real perspectives and this is real data. And uh, on one hand, this is new and it's new data. And like a, another data point I have to share is that our current study that we're running with 4,500 people who've responded and it's daily cannabis users, 91% of people who use cannabis daily, 71% of those people identify as neurodivergent. And wow. it's, a, it's a high that overlap. That is a big crossover. <laughs> and I've been in the industry now for close going on five years and I was in the academic research world of it before then. And I, I think I can say with confidence that like the stoners are my people. I am a stoner. I'm a stoner scientist. I'm part of this community. My friends and my community are people who use cannabis regularly, often and heavily, and we benefit I mean, from it medically, you know? I mean, th thinking about it, kind of people I've I met at university and like, of in my life who do who do that like it's i'm very hard to pressed to find anybody who uses it regularly who either doesn't have mental health conditions or is is different in some way like it you know they yeah. they have their their ocd their adhd they're autistic like usually highly creative like a usually a highly creative type of mind, whether you're working a creative job or not, just like a creative abstract sort of type of type of thinker. It's a, we are coining it and we're, we're publishing, uh, we did, we gave a poster presentation so far, but our paper, we're ca we're calling it the stoner neurotype. It is a specific subset of neurodivergent people who have chronic pain, GI issues and mental health issues that, you know, cannabis specifically happens to rebalance our, our systems and you know it's not uh, that's for what everyone. i think is is like a really you know any anything which which kind of touches on the aspects of like autism and mental health i find to be you know something definitely like worth looking into because i know that specifically like things things like therapy that are not sort of guided by uh, either another autistic person, neurodivergent person, or like a person who has a heavy amount of engagement with like the autistic community or knows people specifically within it, as well as understanding the the different nuances of sort of, is very difficult to find that even in private practice, but also like it's pretty much impossible through like general healthcare in the UK, like to find someone who is you know, going to be good for you in that sense. It's um, same so year. we definitely do have a gap. Like incredibly when difficult and very high rates of mental health as well. Like and we don't, illness. we don't neuro, we don't match, we don't match with, with neurotypicals often in a way that allows us to have that open relationship, you know, with a therapist or with like a, to feel safe and 
seen in that mental health, you know, sort of system. And no, it's a major, this is a major issue. And it's actually one of the reasons why cannabis can be so helpful therapeutically that it, I don't know why this hasn't been used more readily because it's so easily accessible. But the psychedelic therapy model is like gaining speed, like you mentioned with MDMA. This is like, it's clinical, there some but it's crazy also- like results that they've seen with like, particularly like, I think I saw something about psilocybin and like nicotine addiction, something yep crazy recovery rate compared to like the two or three percent that you get with like traditional i mean nicotine nicotine was probably one of my most vicious addictions like i feel like every time i rank the top three i change the order based on which drug i've had the most recently which like i haven't had a benzo in a really long time but the fact that it still makes my mouth water to think about it is kind of like all right that one was like clearly very addictive and actually out of the three of the top three drugs that are the most addictive that's the one i had a prescription for right it was mm. like my prescribed medication but the other two are alcohol I do and get nicotine pres- prescribed i do get prescribed diet dies of ham for like panic attacks and meltdowns i've never i've never particularly had an issue with it necessarily but i definitely do relate to the nicotine aspects of the, it like, the nicotine like the the crave the, the like the pull and the loneliness like it's like an emotional addiction it's like it's a heavy one so yeah no the there's been some really incredible stuff and and cannabis is interesting in that the endocannabinoid system and the serotonin system which the serotonin system is what classic serotonergic psychedelics like psilocybin like psilocin like lsd interacts with the endocannabinoid system has a very close relationship with the serotonin system it's actually something that i gave a presentation on last year um i'm i've been very interested in that intersection because i think that there's an increased therapeutic benefit to using less of both of them together and it is very common for people to use them together it's it's incredibly incredibly common for people to mix psychedelics and cannabis endocannabinoid system is a i think like a cr- crazy widespread throughout like the entire body which i think is why like it has such like a, a variety of different effects and I, I was looking because there, there are like hot things that you produce like in your body which are endogenous like things things that you you produce yourself which act within the endocannabinoid system like i think the i don't know m- maybe THC is like an analog of anandamide, I think. Is it? It's not. Like, it's not an analog, but it's a mimetic. A mimetic. A mimetic. A mimetic. Yeah, so it, it it like imitates. It imitates it. Yes. It's yeah, like the the anandamide is like the thing that you get when you have like a runner's high. I used to be ri- running all the time. Like, oh yeah, I'm in an the endurance. Evening, like. I, I'm endurance athlete all the way for that reason. Definitely. Anandamide is is a special one, and the other one is 2-AG, and yeah, our bodies are creating them right now, like everyone. I always, That used to be one of my favorite things I used to say when I would be like, people, even if you're anti-weed, your body is making an endocannabinoid like right now, and it, it's essential for our, for our like brain's survival. 